We're gonna have a Q&A. Q&As work great when there's, um, when there's Q. And so the Q part is your part, the A part will be my part. And we'll just dive in. Let's see. Who... A couple minutes about you know what it is and what was the passion behind it and what kind of where you, what was the idea. So Aaron's giving me some um, directing back here as we're getting um, people in here. Yeah, I'm really excited. We just launched the Art of Communication. It's uh, the first uh, really intensive masterclass that uh, we've put out into the world. Um, it's something I've thought about for years and years, maybe decades, actually, and. Um, have been hesitant. In fact, thought about writing a book on it, but teaching communication in a book is um, is really challenging. It's almost like trying to teach how to paint um, using math. It, it does, the, the medium doesn't really match what you're trying to help a person access. And so it's just so much easier to help people process the, the, um, the soft skills, the hard skills of communication while you're actually communicating with people. So that's been um, really exciting. And, and I want it to be super um, high level. I didn't want it to really be uh, a one-on-one class only. I wanted it to be a deep dive. I wanted it to be for people who uh, were really serious about communication. So there's, a, uh, there's even a filtering process that's connected in my mind to um, the amount of money that uh, we decided to charge for it. I wanted, um, it, it's, it's interesting because when you provide something for people for free and it doesn't change their life because they didn't put anything into it, they still blame you for it. They still hold you accountable for it. And, but because they didn't pay anything for it, there was no sacrifice for it. There was no investment. They didn't put enough work in to uh, actualize what you gave them. And, and a part of what I wanted to do was to create an environment where uh, people were really serious about learning, really serious about developing their communication skills, really serious about taking um, this to the deepest level possible. Uh, because you can offer the best material in the world, uh, but if the person that is in the room with you doesn't have their own personal posture of going, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to pay the price and uh, make the sacrifices and do the work and develop the disciplines uh, to really apply this to my life. Uh, it, won't functionally bring the change that it has the potential to bring. So I'm really excited because I feel like the people who um, have jumped into the art of communication are the people that will uh, take this on, will do the hard work, uh, will listen to it more than once. We'll go back, you know, it's almost like a buffet. You know, they, they, they tell you that um, if you overeat when you go to a buffet, it's because you start putting everything on your plate the very first moment you get there but people who instinctively are more healthy, they actually walk around the buffet, they canvas everything, and then they decide um, what they're gonna put on their plate. And in some sense, that's almost like the way you need to do the, go through the art of communication. You need to just listen to the six hours and 15 minutes and just get a, a lay of the land and get an overarching meta narrative of what um, you're being taken into. And then you need to go back and begin to dive into the, uh, specifics in the art of communication that um, that even deal perhaps more specifically with where you are in your life um, and also where your strengths and weaknesses are. You, you know, you may instantly hit a section and go, oh, wow, I think that, that I'm in my sweet spot here. This I'm really good at this part. And then you get to a different section and you go, wow, I'm a real deficit here. Uh, this this has really tapped into something that's really missing in my um, my communication skills. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited. I, I think it's, um, it's an intensely therapeutic process. Uh, you cannot go through the art of communication and not deal with who you are, not deal with your inner voice, not deal with what your message is. And, um, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm as equally as excited about how you'll become a better communicator to how uh, you're gonna go through a process of self-discovery in your own life. All right, let's see. It looks like we have, um, a good group of people on with us. We have a lot of questions are already um, popping in. You should check the, Zoom real quick. check the Zoom. Right here. I don't even know what that means. Okay, this meeting can be well, live streamed. Will the article condition ever turn into workshops or a live seminar? 
So should I answer the questions from here or from here? Both. Both? I would go to them okay. first and then go up edgy. Well, uh, Ariana asks, will the art of communication ever turn to a workshop or a live seminar? And the answer is yes, it will. And uh, we'll be uh, probably doing some um, art of communication kind of experiences around the country and invite people to join me and to do some deep dives. And I've been thinking about how that looks, may, um, may look for some uh, willing victims where I can actually dissect their messages in front of an audience. And, uh, but you know, it's gotta be ruthless. It's gonna be a bloodbath. So um, the, the people who do that have to be willing uh, to uh, be thrown into the volcano for the good of everyone else who's there. <laughs> and, um, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. And um, we may actually even take like one of our communicators and do a before and after. Isn't that what they do like at Weight Watchers and everything else? Like all the gyms, all the personal trainers go, this is what it looked like before he came in. This is what it looked like afterwards. We may take one of our communicators who's been with us for a long time ago. These are these are the things that he did early on, and this is what it looks like now. And so I, I think there's gonna be some real practical things, but I also think that live interactions can actually um, help us just deal more with granular things along the way where you're bringing your specific questions. Okay, Aaron has a question. From Gray Tonic, I put my question on IG post earlier. Who is this course specifically designed for? Um, and that's who? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Know. All right. The question is, who is this course specifically designed for? And, you, you know, I think there's a very, very specific target and then a broader target. For me, the very specific target is uh, the course is designed for everyone who was like me when I was 25 or 24. Everyone who um, had a sense that they had a message they needed to get out to the world or had an aspiration to be able to speak into people's lives and um, and make an impact. And, you know, back then I was speaking to, you know, 20 people, 30 people in really informal environments. Sometimes I was actually speaking on the streets and the Mardi Gras and uh, other festivals and events. I remember once, not just once, actually quite a few times, I would literally walk into restaurants and, and, um, and end up having the whole restaurants in a conversation with me. If you could pick one specific person, who would that, that person be? Yeah. So that the one person is the person who, um, is, committed to becoming a, the best communicator humanly possible for themselves. And it doesn't matter the context or the environment. If you're a business person or an entrepreneur or a pastor or a youth pastor, or you're a husband or a wife, or you're just trying, you're a teacher, or you're trying to learn how to communicate in your small group or with your friends or your uh, coworkers, uh, you know, the, the art of communication is probably the most essential uh, competency that you need for any level of success in any area of life. So it doesn't really matter where the application is, learning how to communicate effectively with other people is the most critical competency for your success. So it's like everyone who's aware that communication is the most important competency um, for their success in life. All right, let's see. Uh, you and Aaron mentioned how this is both geared toward faith and business communication. Uh, well, I don't separate that because I, I think a lot of people in the business world have faith, <laughs> and uh, and um, and and talk about two separate tracks of, of helping pastors yeah. achieve something or helping business entrepreneurs achieve something. Yeah. What what sort of topics do you dive into both? Now, the art of communication is designed um, in a purely uh, general um, domain where it helps anyone and er, anywhere. So it's not. Um, contextualized for pastors, it's not contextualized for entrepreneurs, it's not contextualized for business people only. And so I was very, very careful to talk about these principles in a way that they apply to any arena. And so I give you the principles, you have to apply it to your specific environment and to your place. Uh, but uh, I will be doing some other kind of events that will help people hone in those principles in their environment, because um, what you would do with a pastor is very different than what you would do with, let's say, a salesperson or what you would do with an entrepreneur. And, um, and so those are more like um, specialized workshops. The art of and, that's connected to the art of and that's connected to the art of communication. Those are things that will come up over the next year that will be uh, more and more available. Um, I have a question. Oh. What, was the best, what was the best advice on communicating you have received and who gave it to you? The best advice I ever received on communication and who gave it to me. Uh, the first advice I ever remember was um, the guy who was the pastor where I came to faith in Jesus in Orlando, Florida. His name was Jim Henry. 
And he only met with me once in my entire life, I think, maybe, maybe twice. And both times were probably 15 minutes. And uh, he said to me, preach what you know, not what you don't know. <laughs> And uh, that was really great advice because at that time I didn't know anything. <laughs> so I had very limited material from which I could work. It really has helped me throughout my life. Um, whenever I try to go past what I know, you have this incredible anxiety that you're gonna be caught as a poser. And um, if you speak from what you know, you can actually speak with incredible conviction. And that's one of the things I would say is like, don't learn how to communicate something that isn't true to who you are. Um, you know, the art of communication should be exercised in the arenas where you actually have genuine conviction. And I think that's the best advice I was ever given. Uh, you know, preach what you know and not what you don't know. And which actually also inspired me to learn a lot. I wanted to know a lot of things. So if I could only speak about the things I know and not things I don't know, I wanted to make sure I knew a lot about a lot of things so that I was not limited in the arenas or domains that I could actually speak into. Um, hi, so good, is there only one passion or can there be more than one? What's, I, I think what's interesting is it's, it's maybe a different pendulum. Um, people who are really passionate tend to have a lot of passions. And uh, so it's not that, you, is it only one passion? My question is like, how hot are you? Like, what's the degree of your fire? How passionate a person are you? you? You know, I don't know if you ever met like an Italian, you know, and, uh, and uh, in the Cinque Terre or something like that. You know, when you meet an Italian, you're like, they're passionate about everything. You know, they're, they're passionate about pasta. They're passionate about politics. They're passionate about Catholicism. They're passionate about everything. And so really the question is, are you passionate about anything? Just pick something that elevates your passion. That'll begin to expand to other places. Um, let's see. What's the biggest area for growth you see in young communicators? Uh, the biggest area for growth that I see in young communicators, I think there's two sides. In young communicators who are like pastors and speakers in the arena of faith, I think the biggest area of growth is relevance and that their language is so inaccessible to an unbelieving world that they don't even realize that um, they're really good communicators for Christians. They're really good communicators for church conferences. They're really good communicators for people who believe. Uh, and they're refining the wrong skill. And it's very, very much like when I learned how to play tennis, I learned how to serve pretty well, holding the racket completely wrong. And then a, a friend who was a professional athlete said, hey, I can make your serve immensely stronger, but I have to break it down and start from scratch. And I didn't want to start from scratch, but I went ahead and did it, and I was terrible at first. And, and I know I've, I've worked with really one of America's um, most popular young speakers. And when I started walking him through some things he needed to change, he told me it was almost impossible. He said, I, I felt like I was a worse speaker as I was trying to shift. And one of the things I talked to him a lot about was authenticity, uh, moving from performance to authenticity. And, and frankly, he was a great performer. And, but he wasn't as good a communicator when he was authentic because he was uncomfortable in that space. And you have this J curve where when you're leaving something that, that you're comfortable with that really doesn't make you relevant to the new world, uh, you get worse before you get better. And so I think that's the number one thing I see with people in the world of faith. And on the business sales side. in the business and sales side, um, it's similar. I think the challenge is... Um, connecting to your most authentic self. I think a lot of times what happens is that entrepreneurs, salespeople, business people who um, have to convince and persuade, they tend to take on a persona because in their mind, that persona uh, can sell. And it, it almost is a way of compensating for their nervousness or their fear. And, not, and they don't trust that just becoming their most authentic human self is the best way of connecting. So then you're not even thinking about selling something, you're just thinking about serving someone. And I think that shift is the most significant shift in, in the sales environment. All right, let's see. Um, so good, let's see, I'm 24 and beginning, oh, yeah, I, I lost it. Says, it says here, I have it right here. I'm 24 and beginning in this world. How much time do I have to invest in a topic when preparing a 35 minute message? Excuse my English, I'm from Guatemala. His name's Kevin. 
Uh, well, Kevin, if it's something you really care about, um, you should start becoming an expert now and spend the next 15 years really becoming good at it. And um, one of the things I did early on when I was developing my communication style, which I did not um, uh, unwrap in the art of communication, is that um, early on, I picked four to six messages that I would develop every year. And I would refine that message and I would use those six messages everywhere I went. And what helped me was every time I refined it and got better and better and better, it taught me a skill that now I could transfer when I was starting from scratch. And, and so one of the things I would say is that if you know nothing about a topic, it might take you a hundred hours because you need to do a massive amount of, of um, behind the scenes research. Your message should only be 10% of your knowledge at most. If you're speaking and you're giving people 100% of what you know, it's gonna come across really thin and you're gonna bog down, you're gonna get boring, uh, you're gonna get insecure and you're not gonna know what to do. The most powerful thing is when you only have enough time for like 1% of your knowledge. So you're having to cram that into that small section and you don't have to worry about forgetting something because you know so much that even if you got, forgot something, you have a hundred other things that could fill in that space. So what I would say is be so prepared that you could forget everything and still talk for 30 minutes about the subject. And that goes deeper, right? You talk about living your message, being your message. Yeah, and I think that's a part of it too because of, of the space where I come from in terms of ministry and communicating the message in life of Jesus. Um, it's so important to, to, um, to live an authentic life. And the way you do that is you, you don't preach what you don't live. You preach what you live. And you, but, and also it doesn't mean you can't like, you can't, you can't talk about anything because you're imperfect. You just talk about it from your imperfection, <laughs> you know? And if I had to wait till I had something down a hundred percent before I could speak on it, I wouldn't be talking to you about anything, right? You know, and, and, and so what you want to do is you don't want to act like you're the person who arrived and now you're sending them a roadmap for how to get to where you are. You, you need to let them know, you know, I'm on my camel too, traveling through the desert. And, uh, but I've been through this before. So let me tell you what I've learned through experience. And it really is um, about bringing your most authentic self, sharing where you are, not being afraid of being imperfect, that your, your humanity is, is a part of what makes the message uh, transformational. Let's see. All right, what else we got? Okay. Um, will the master class come in Spanish soon? The master class will not come with me speaking in Spanish. I just did it in six hours and fifteen minutes in English, uh, but we will put subtitles in it, and uh, and so it's going to come with Spanish captions. So you know, I watch Casa de Papel, and I know everyone in Latin America loves Casa de Papel. And, and everyone in Latin America watches it with subcaptions because no one can understand um, Spain. <laughs> no one can understand Castellano. And, uh, and so when they're speaking, everyone who's Spanish goes, I don't know what he just said. So uh, if you can watch a whole series with subtitles, you can watch the art of communication as well. All right, let's see what else we got. How long do you, okay, no we already kind of dealt with that. Um, what is the line drawn between good and bad rep repetition and sermons? Wow. Um, the moment you're thinking about repetition, it's probably too many times, <laughs> you know, and um, bad reputation, bad repetition is when everyone knows you're repeating it. Good repetition is when you're saying it just enough times where people don't forget it. And, and so I think it's, it's very much a, a kind of an issue of feel, um, but I kind of think that, oh, there's a preaching style that I just, wow, I would like to kill. And um, it, it, this, is, this is the structure. Tell them what you're gonna say, say it, then tell them what you said, All right? That's what a lot of young preachers are, are taught. And if I could set something on fire, like I like to do like a preaching installation where I could set that on fire and it never would exist again. It's that don't tell them what you're going to say. 
that just eliminated all the mystery. And uh, don't tell them what you said, that's treating people like they're stupid. And uh, create mystery, make them want what you're gonna say, then say it, and then apply it so that what you say has action that will change their life. There you go, that's the simple replacement for that uh, framework. That was worth all the money you paid for the Zoom call. I know you didn't pay for the Zoom call. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what processes do you go through to see freshness in, in the familiar, particularly with uh, whether it's content or by the Bible scriptures that have been preached on many times? How do you see the same things with fresh eyes? That's a great question. How do you see um, the same thing with fresh eyes? Um, first of all, one of the things on a personal level that I would love to do is I would love to teach pastors and um, you know young leaders how to see the Bible with fresh eyes, um, how, how to see truth that's been there for thousands of years in a way as if no one's ever seen it before. I just think that's a really important thing to bring um, to faith. Uh, but, it, but it's true in everyday life. And, and, a, and here's a, a couple of things. One, the more you see something, the more you are blind to it. And you don't actually see it anymore. It becomes so familiar, you become... Um, um, unaware of its presence. And so some of it is you, you have to choose to live with childlike wonder every single day. You have to choose to look at things as if you've never seen them before. You have to choose to be surprised by things. And, and so some of it is when you're trying to bring a message or bring a talk or uh, make a presentation, if there isn't a moment that kind of surprises you, it's not going to surprise anybody else. If there isn't a moment that inspires you, it's not going to inspire anybody else. There, there, there needs to be these moments in your, um, in your presentation where it's almost like surprising you because you're hearing yourself say something to you that you need to hear. And the moment you go, wow, I need to hear this. I need to apply this to my life. That's the moment you're, you're tapping into something really special that um, your audience is going to um, be incredibly moved by. And um, when my, my friend John Gordon reminded me of this that I told him a long time ago, that good speakers, um, in a sense, make you feel something, but great speakers feel something and bring you into that experience. And, and so what I would say is the way you keep it fresh is you make sure you feel something. If you feel nothing from your message, I want to guarantee you, your audience isn't feeling anything either. Um, What's the best way to read a room? How do you actually do it? What do you look for? How do you connect before you connect? What's the best way to read a room? You're asking me to teach you Jedi level communication when I'm just introducing you to a lightsaber for the first time. And so, you know, I want you to understand, Padawan, that, that there are things I can teach you, but you're not ready to learn yet. But let me give you the beginning of that. Um, the best way to read a room is to uh, meet people who are going into the room before they walk into the room. Um, one of the nice things in my life is that even when I'm supposedly well-known, I'm fairly anonymous. Like, um, I, I can walk into a room a lot of times and because people don't know, oh, he has a beard or he changed his hairstyle or he's wearing a hat or they don't, uh, people don't realize it's me. And so I'm out there meeting people, talking to people interacting with people and I'm listening and learning where they're at. And, you know, and sometimes there's people, Hey, what are you, what are you hoping to get from today? And I'm actually interviewing people and learning what their expectations are. It's, it's so much fun when I get out on the platform and they realize, Oh, you know, he's the guy that they brought in to speak at this event. And so as long as you can have a little bit of anonymity, it's so much fun to talk to people. But even if you don't, even if everyone knows you're the one speaking, uh, talking to people, interacting with them, getting a sense of where they're at. Um, that's, that's a part of how you can read a room. You read a room by reading it before they get into the room. And, and I think that's a huge part. And then just paying attention uh, before you're speaking, like not being so much in your head that you're not paying attention to the room. Are people excited? Are they, are they, are, are they there out of obligation? Are they leaning backwards? Are they leaning forward? Is there energy in the room? Is the room lacking energy? Um, there's just so many obvious things that you can do that are easy up front. 
What else we got, Aaron? Okay. I'm not a passer or a business owner. Is it still worth it for me for the sake of sharpening a skill? Yeah, unless you're going to like live a nomadic life where you interact with zero humans, you're going to need to learn how to communicate at, at a masterful level. I, I'm telling you, I cannot emphasize this enough. Like um, with, with uh, kids, when, I, when we were raising our kids, I knew if I could get my kids to learn how to read and learn how to communicate and do enough math where they can um, pay their bills and follow their bank accounts, they have everything necessary for extraordinary success. And a part of the reason you need to learn how to read is because reading expands your imagination and your intelligence so that you actually have something to say. And you need to learn how to communicate because communicators create the future. Communicators start companies. Communicators get the promotions. Communicators get the girl. And, uh, you know, they get, and, uh, because if you don't learn how to communicate your, your heart, your thoughts, your values, your vision, your ideas, uh, you're going to feel landlocked. You're going to be like this treasure that has no access to the outside world. So uh, I, I don't, I can't imagine anyone who doesn't need to develop the art of communication. How do I walk on stage properly for Mitchell? Uh, Mitchell, that's a really good question. It's interesting. Because um, I've, I've had to um, struggle through some significant injuries, like two, two knee surgeries, uh, torn Achilles. Uh, um, what did you tell me the first time you, I walked on stage? I, what walk are, on stage. I, I, I tell people, when you're going upstairs, stairs, go up the stairs fast. And I said, it's really simple. Just go up quick. And the reason I'm saying it, I had all these injuries, but even when I had like a torn Achilles heel, Behind the stage, I would put the crutch down or the cane down, and I would hop up that stage fast. And because if you're walking up slow, you're telling the room, hey, it's going to be really slow, really boring. I don't have a lot to bring. I don't have a lot to say. And, I, and so you'll notice, like, I walk up the stage fast. I go bam, 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 bam. I want people to know I am here. I am present. I am ready to go. You need to be ready. So when I run up those stairs, everyone psychologically runs up the stairs with me and is ready to go. Small things that make huge differences. What else we got, Aaron? What does preparing a talk logistically look like for you? And what is your routine in preparing a talk? How did it start 20? I want to add to that. How, does it, how did it start 30 years ago when you first when you would sit in the parks and read everything you possibly could? Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't have an office, so I would go to a park. And I would hide behind a tree. I would take my laptop and my Bible. And, and, and then I would just start one, whenever I'm like starting a talk, a lot of times I don't know the subject. So I'm first, I'm trying to find a subject that I'm going to talk about. And, and so some of it for me is I just search and search and I might start looking at 10 different subjects until I find one that really just captures me. And then when I find a topic or a message or a subject or an issue that really feels compelling to me, then I start doing like a deep dive. And I always tell people, um, especially even like, you know, pastors are told, hey, what you need is prayer and the Bible. There's only two things you need to prepare a message. And I'm like, I know a lot of pastors who believe in the Bible and pray and their messages are really boring. And prayer and Bible is not what makes the difference in your message. It's imagination and experience. And when... I ask a question. <laughs> How many, sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I'm going to say it as loud as I can. How many hours did you, would you put in a message each week when you first were starting out, like year one to year five? I don't know. I would say somewhere between 10 and 20 hours. And uh, um, I'm not, I wasn't one of those people that put 40 hours into a message. Uh, but How would you break that up? Two days, one day? I think that probably I would, I, I work in three hour spurts. I find that anything more than three hours is, is, so, so so poorly productive that I just I'm just pretending I'm working rather than working. I've got three hours where I can be at a really high level. I can download massive information. I can research and not be uh, distracted. But those three hours, it, here's the difference. Like when I had to speak on Sunday, if I could get those three hours on Monday right away, my mind would think about that subject all week long. So it was like three hours of intensity and then 300 hours 
of open system. And then suddenly I would see something in a magazine or see something on the internet or see something on a TV show or experience something at the grocery store. And that now was filtered around this subject that I'm gonna talk about. And so it was as if, because I had this in my head for three hours, I was able to start connecting all these things that would have seemed disconnected if I didn't already know what I was trying to communicate. So I'd say the first three hours are the most important and then begin to expand your imagination and, your, and, and start tapping into your experience going, when, have I, when have, have, have I experienced this in my life? If I'm talking about forgiveness, like when, when was it in my life where I wasn't willing to forgive? Or what, what was the time that I had the most difficult time but I did forgive? Or, or when was the time in my life I really needed forgiveness and I couldn't get it? Like I, I really start going through my experience and going, um, what is my human experience around this topic? And I just start downloading all that into the template. It's, it's more of a, of a mind map for me. I just throw everything on the canvas, not knowing what is going to make it to the message. Does this course talk about culture, context, or how do you navigate when, when preparing a message and you speak in multiple different countries? Um, it doesn't talk as much about culture it talks about creating a culture because when you go in and just try to observe a culture, you don't realize that the moment you're there, that culture is different. And um, if you're going to speak to lead, you don't want to leave the culture the same. And, and I can tell you, this is like the most practical experience for me. I remember when I went, I went to Korea for the first time and everyone's like, Oh, Korean culture, it's very difficult and everything like that. You know, you have to, understand this and this and this. After my first message, there were a table of pastors, the largest churches virtually in the whole country. And they asked me this very specific question. How did you figure out the Korean code? That was the phrase they used. How did you figure out the Korean code? And I said, what do you mean? They said, you somehow know the code, the Korean culture. Your message just opened everyone up. And this has been true everywhere I went. The places that have stood up to me the most was when I was in Tokyo, Japan, when I was in Paris, France. And I was in these different places where they said, these people are unreceptive, they're not open, they're not gonna respond. And when I was in Beirut, Lebanon, talking to a room jam-packed with um, leaders from Hamas, uh, Muslim communities, and, and, uh, and others who were in um, other sects of Islam. And I have never had a culture in the world that I did not connect to. I've never had a culture in the world that did not resonate with my message the very first time. And the reason is once you understand human intrinsics, once you understand humanity, you can go to any culture and then you extricate all the cultural biases that you bring into the room. See, it's really not about understanding their culture. It's about understanding all of the culture you're bringing into the room and making sure that you're not using, bringing that in and expecting everyone to connect to you. Does this course only cover oral communication or does it go into different mediums like writing? Can you, if you could rephrase my questions a little yeah. bit because I don't think they can hear me. Yeah, Aaron's asking, or someone's asking, is it, does this course only cover verbal communication? Does it also cover uh, written communication? Right. Other mediums. Frankly, um, I, I struggled with which medium I would actually focus on because this material is the same material that I would use on how to write, but I would just apply it differently to the written context. And so if you're a writer, this is exactly the same material that you would need, that you would need on how to speak. You just have to translate it into the written word. Because for me, even communicating audibly is still the written word. You're just writing it on the hearts of people. And so there, it's, it's the same medium and, and the, the, the text is still audible because you're writing it down, but they're hearing it the moment they're reading it. So you need to realize that the, the verbal communication and written communication are the same journeys just backwards. And it's just this really beautiful, beautiful experience. And so uh, I love writing and I'll probably do some specialized uh, seminars that apply the art of communication into the written context. Who is your communication coach? Have you ever had one? And who's your inspiration on the communication side? Yeah, I've never had a communication coach. I, 
I would have loved to have a communication coach. That would have been wonderful. But when I was getting my master's degree, I took every single class the school offered on communication. I didn't even care if I got my degree. I only cared that I took every single class. And I took all the different varied professors I could find, from the ones that I liked to the ones I didn't like, uh, to the ones that I resonated with, the ones I didn't, because I figured if this guy's teaching a, a preaching class, a communication class, uh, there's something there that I'm going to learn. And so I, I, the, the four years that I spent getting my master's degree, um, I studied communication intensely. And then I studied an endless number of the best communicators in the world. I would listen to their messages on a daily basis um, to uh, almost to an extreme level. And I would study, I would break down what was it? Because you have to realize I came from outside of the faith. So I wanted to understand why does that person get to me? Why, why does this person not get to me? How is it that this person gets me to laugh and then gets into the deepest part of my soul, gets me to deal with some of the dark areas of my life? What about this person? Why am I turned off? Why are all the doors inside of my soul shut down the moment this guy's speaking? And, and I, I would, from the very beginning, I began dissecting um, the process and I did it as a listener so that I could also then transform it as a communicator. Do you believe introverts can be as great communicators as extroverts? Do I believe that introverts could be as great communicators as extroverts? I think extroverts have a harder time being great communicators. Which one are you, introvert or extrovert? And I'm really more introverted. And, um, and so I actually think introverts can be better communicators because they don't need the stage as much. And, and so then the, um, the dynamic of the importance of the message um, is what gets them on the platform. And, but um, if you're an extrovert, what you need to do on stage is make sure that uh, you, you take time for deep reflection and, can, and let people in. Because the challenge of being an extrovert is that oftentimes extrovert messages go to people and uh, rather than pull people in. And the, the power of an introvert message is that you're, you're pulling people into your private space. And, um, and, and I think there's something really uniquely powerful in that. Oops. Okay. okay. Um, do, you actively, do you actively try to include humor when you speak? Is it planned? Um, is my humor planned? I plan to be funny. I don't know what's going to be funny. <laughs> I don't plan jokes. I don't have pre-planned jokes. I don't go, oh, this will work. And uh, for me, my humor is very much a part of my own jaded personality and my, my ability to see life from a very skewed perspective. I think the best humor is honest observation of life, saying it to everyone in the room, what everyone knows, but no one believes you just said. And um, so I think humor is really important. Uh, by the way, in every culture, humor is the last thing that is acquired in learning a new language. And, and humor is one of the highest forms of intelligence. And, and so um, if you wanna work on your IQ, learn how to be funnier. Hi, uh, people are laughing. That was good. People are <laughs> laughing. Okay, well, we've been doing this for 45 minutes. We're 15 minutes over when we said we were gonna do this. Do you wanna take one last question? Sure, we'll do one, we'll take one, one last question. I think this is a really good one because I think this kind of like leads into the first section of the five elements, but Mary asks, will the course discuss managing emotions while communicating? Wow, that's a great, great question. And um, I think that it's not gonna talk about how to manage your emotions. It's gonna talk about how to harness your emotions which is very, very different. And so let me just give you a really quick uh, emotional management framework. Never use the stage to do personal therapy. Like when people ask me, how do I know if I'm sharing too much? When, when am I too transparent? When am I too revealing? It's very simple. When you're telling a story to help other people, uh, you won't overshare it'll be healthy and it'll, um, it'll feel appropriate. But when you're telling a story for personal catharsis and therapy, it's gonna be really awkward and everyone in the room is gonna know, oh wow, she's still bitter or wow, he's still dealing with that. 
And, uh, and so I think you have to make sure that you've dealt with this issue and, uh, and that you've already done the personal work that you can tell that story from the side of um, strength, not from the side of being a victim. I have one last question, just kidding. Vusani, this is a really good question. Vusani, I'm pitching for VC funding and communication is important. How can this course help me develop my communication skills? Oh, so much. Um, uh, first of all, if you're pitching to VCs, uh, no one has a better like BS radar than people who are gonna invest their money. They're just gonna read you so fast if you're trying to sell them, pitch them, perform. And so I think it's really important uh, when you're gonna pitch for money to make sure that what you're pitching has sold you, that it's something that you genuinely believe in. And don't ask for people's money unless it's the best thing for their money. And, and when you believe, wow, I don't want you to miss out on this. And I don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. Like if you're, if you're a venture capitalist, your job is to find the opportunities that will create the future and create wealth for you and your investors. And this is it. And so I think a huge part of it is um, knowing you have something of genuine value to bring to others, um, having an expertise where you know your stuff inside and out. And, uh, and then you're, you're not selling, trying to convince someone to do something that they shouldn't do. You're creating an opportunity for people that you know will benefit if they join you too. What are key elements in the course that can connect to what he's doing right now? What, what exactly would, what part would you recommend? Him for? I think that the uh, course on um, human intrinsics, the section on human intrinsics, the, the three core intrinsics are really important for pitching. Okay. Well, I don't want to go into detail. You have to go and study the course. Yeah, we'll give him a, and, okay. <laughs> just give him like a, a little teaser. Um, well, the, any pitch has to connect to um, at least three basic universal um, expectations. And one of them is progress. Uh, they're not going to become a part of something that they do not believe has an inherent ability to create a future. And so people are looking for something that intrinsically says, oh, wow, this thing has natural progress. It has momentum. It's going to go somewhere in the future. And that's a really exciting part of it. But another part of it, too, is like when people have money, they want to be, it's not just about making money. They want to feel like they're doing something special, something unique. They might be looking for meaning. They might be looking for something that, that helps them get up in the morning, do some, know that I'm doing something that matters in the world. Or, you know, maybe they, they care about the environment or they care about providing healthier food for children, or they care about providing a product that makes the world better. And you have to help them connect to the meaning of what you're doing and how that actually makes their life more meaningful. Uh, never assume a person with billions of dollars isn't searching for more meaning in their life. And so the, the basic human intrinsics are essential uh, when you're actually trying to connect to people, even in sales, and even when you're looking for um, capital. Okay, I'm going to close this out. Is that okay? All right. Okay. You guys are absolutely amazing for jumping on this live, jumping on this Zoom. The price goes up. He doesn't like doing this part, so I'm going to do this part. The price <laughs> goes up at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time tomorrow morning. Um, thank you guys for who, who, everyone who's shown interest, everyone who's just jumped on these things, asked incredible questions. Like we took notes of all the questions, and now we're going to, I mean, I want to study them and even <laughs> go over them more. Price goes up tomorrow, 9 a.m. So go to theartofcommunication.org, check it out, sign up, uh, buy it now and just dive in. And then we will catch you when you're done binging all of the content. All right. The next hey, thank you guys so much. God bless. Take care. Bye, guys.